just couple of charts. This is uh, the distribution of marks in quiz one after the crib session. So it's a little steeper than I wanted. So that's why we scaled down quiz one from fourteen to seven. So that you know the low part of the curve doesn't suffer unnecessarily. Maybe to the first exam, a little too difficult. Um, this is midterm before cribs. So there is a bit more leveling out at the mid range. So this is considered a reasonably healthy curve. So midterm will stay at 16. Um, and you know we have been doing histogram equalization and so on so you can figure out what to do with it. Um, so that's the two exam status. You can see the highest is actually full marks. So there are people who are doing pretty well. Now today what's the plan? So the plan is to keep talking about separate compilation um, and more system details about you know uh, compiling, linking and so on few compiler flags that will help you along. And uh, because the other, the second lecture today won't happen, I didn't even know about this actually. Um, so instead of proceeding further on to recursion and so on, dynamic programming, what I thought I would do is uh, discuss one or two interesting problems. Um, in particular, uh, the Wednesday lab lead, lead to one such issue. Uh, this is the one where you are given a, what's called a semi-magic square. So a, a magic square is one where the rows, columns and diagonals all add up to the same number. A semi-magic square is where you exclude the diagonals from that rule. Okay. So all the, each row and each column adds up to the same positive integer. Okay. Uh, so there is a theorem which says that any semi-magic square can be decomposed into a sum of permutation matrices. So a permutation matrix is one where uh, it's an n by n square matrix where each row and each column has exactly one one in it. Think like nine queens sort of problem. Okay. So it's not too difficult to see why it's an intuitive theorem. You, you give me a matrix with only non-negative integers in it and every row and every column adds up to exactly the same positive integer. You can keep you know, subtracting. Uh, so suppose given such a matrix where each row and each column adds up to some constant c integer. I manage to subtract one permutation matrix out of it so that the row and column sums decrease to c minus 1. Then you can keep doing it. So the basic step is how do you subtract one permutation matrix from it. But that leads to a non-trivial issue. So we'll see how to solve these things. So for the lab itself, we'll of course try to normalize it based on relative difficulties of labs, in particular for labs which had unintended hardness here and there. But uh, I wasn't looking for necessarily a polynomial time solution. The first part didn't say anything about complexity. If you gave a very inefficient algorithm but which was correct, you'd get full marks. Anyway, we'll come back to that uh, once we're done with the primary part of the lecture. So today, we will uh, mostly continue with discussing system details, how to split up your code into different files and how to compile them separately and so on. Um, and then we'll get to that interesting multiple loop problem, whatever. Okay, so I'll just quickly retrace some of the things we talked about last time just in case we forget. Uh, your uh, process in the computer is allocated three memory segments. Each is logically numbered from some base address upward. Um, and just for simplicity, we'll assign arbitrary base addresses to each of these segments. We'll say a start main from 1000, uh, some function you wrote from 2000, etc. doesn't matter. But the data and stack segments are totally different from the code segment. And the hardware prevents you from making illegal accesses into one of the segments in a way that you should not. Okay. So the code segment stores executable code in a read-only logic. So you cannot write that code normally. Uh, the data segment is called the heap and it contains a jumble of bits uh, which represent things like strings, vectors, matrices and all those things. Okay. And later on we'll see how to allocate space out of the heap for yourself. Currently we're doing it only through classes that other people wrote for us like vector and string. But soon enough we'll see how to allocate and manipulate memory from the heap and then return it to the system. It's a dangerous game. The heap is entirely under your control and you can trample over the bits and mess up what those bits mean. 
Um, but we'll see that in a couple of weeks. The stack segment is what we are focusing on now. It's the memory used for um, A, communication between the caller and callee. B, keeping track of pending work. So when the callee finishes, how to return back correctly to the caller and be able to do this in a nested fashion in case you have nested function calls. But there's another invisible bullet which I haven't written here, which is every time you declare this kind of a scope, so suppose you were um, going along in your code and you had for int something, okay. Remember, this int x has visibility only in the scope and it disappears after there. Okay. Inside you may well declare float y, etc. These x and y, these are local short-lived variables. Okay. They are in effect, okay. so x is in effect throughout the for loop. y is in fact even more short-lived. y dies and gets reallocated every iteration of the for loop. Okay. So in fact, there's like this invisible curly around here and y is declared inside that, whereas x is, lives throughout the execution of the for loop. So where are these allocated? The stack is also used to allocate these. Okay. And the reason is very clear. The stack is designed for last in first out operation. And clearly these curlies have to be properly nested for your program to compile and give executable code. The, the discipline is that you have to close curlies in matching pairs. And therefore it's a natural paradigm for a stack. As soon as you enter a curly, you can allocate space for all the variables declared in that scope. And when that curly bracket is closed, you can free up the memory on the stack. So the stack is used for a whole bunch of things. The activation records that communicate data between the caller and the callee. It's also used in the same package, basically, for saved registers. Remember, the caller has a particular state of all the registers in the system, if the callee goes and mangles them, then the callee should restore them before transferring control back to the caller. Otherwise, the caller is completely lost. Its state has been completely destroyed. And the third thing is this variables. I think sometimes they're called automatic variables, but let's call them local variables declared in some scope. So anytime there's a scope, something like this happens. Um, the scoping can be static, it can be visible through the use of nested scopes, or it could be dynamic, it could be a result of one function calling another one. Okay. So those are the purposes of the stack. The stack is used whenever there is this natural nesting. You get in somewhere, you get out of it. Okay. And uh, then we saw that in case of a call, uh, here's a simplified diagram of how the stack is manipulated. The stack pointer always points to the top of the stack. And in this picture, it's kind of drawn inverted. Addresses increase upward from the base of the stack segment. So the stack pointer is a special register. You cannot directly manipulate it, just like program counter is a special register. The program counter is manipulated only through executing an instruction, in which case PC advances to the next instruction, or through jumps. If you jump, then the program counter will be set to wherever you're jumping. Okay. Now similarly, the SP is manipulated only by calls and returns or by opening scope and removing scope, closing a scope. So uh, if main calls fun one and fun one calls fun two, initially the stack is empty, main is running, there's nothing more to do after main returns. Um, the communication between main and fun one is packaged into that activation record, plus save registers if any, and stack pointer is bumped up to represent that there is now something in the stack and it's not non empty, not, not empty. Then when fun1 calls fun2, there's an additional record pushed on top of the previous record, which, rec which stores this interaction between fun1 and fun2. When fun2 returns, perhaps without calling anyone else, then this record can be taken off from the stack because fun2 is done. And then when fun1 returns, the stack becomes empty again. So it's this discipline of growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking as the code executes. So what goes into this activation record? Here's a simple example, although for functions with lots of parameters, it will get more complicated. In case of the absolute function, which takes an integer by value and then returns another integer, it's very simple. Uh, the activation record has three fields. One is what value is input into abs. 
uh, out is what value is output from apps back to the caller. And the last is this code address to jump to when the return happens. Okay. Um, and the code for apps itself looks like the lower uh, this table here. The left hand column gives you the program counter, uh, or rather the memory address of the instruction. So the very first address where apps is executed is 2000 in this example. And the first thing you do is you copy the stack.top.in, the in field of the activation record into a register A. And then uh, 2001 says if A is already positive, then you don't need to do 2002. You can skip to 2003. That's what changes the PC if necessary. Otherwise in 2002, you uh, flip the sign of A, register A. In instruction at 2003, we write out the resulting value to wherever apps is supposed to send its output, which is stack.top.out. So in that field, in this slot here, uh, space to write return value, you write out uh, A. And then in 2004, you again change the PC by going to the to-do field of that table. Okay. So and that can be used um, in this case, yes. Uh, depends on what the value it called with. So if it's called with minus three, then it, it will change a. That's right. It doesn't change the input. Thing. Yes. Then why two thousand two? Hmm. In two thousand two, statement number two thousand two. Yes. A equal to minus three. Yes. But how can we change a, sir? You are changing the a that is inside abs itself. That is perfectly allowed. Okay. And then I am returning it back through out. The caller's value is not changed. That is correct. You are only finding either A or minus A and returning it from apps. But uh, hmm. so the function itself is not changing the local A. The function is changing the local A as in a register in this case. A, think of A as a register. That register is changed. It is negated. And that negative value is written out to the top of the stack. So, so at the end of the main function, if we uh, write the value of A, hmm. then uh, No, but you cannot. Remember the signature of abs is int abs int, right? So the signature says int abs int A. Okay. Therefore, in main, when you call it, you have to say something like, say, x equal to minus 3, but then you say y equal to abs x. Okay. So this will not be changed, but whatever is returned, that will be the negative value. So why will be 3 and x will be minus 3? Y will be 3, yes. Right. So and that's because abs communicates its output value through this tag dot top dot out. That's why. Now, you could work out an example where we pass by reference. Okay. In case of pass by reference, there has to be, in that in field, there has to be a flag saying that this is actually an address. So if you say, you know, abs becomes changes signature to say void make abs int and y with the intention that abs will actually flip the sign of the input, modify it. Then the thing that's passed into in has to be an address. And when you flip the sign here, you have to actually add access the cell pointed by that address. So anytime you have parameters passed by reference into a body of a function, and then the function is changing the value of that parameter, you have to look up that address rather than using in directly. Okay. Fine. So here's the call sequence. Yeah. So the Statements leading up to the call is in yellow. The call itself is just a transfer of program counter from one place to the other. That's shown in pink. And then after the callee returns to the caller, the cleanup code of the caller is shown in uh, bluish. Okay. So in this particular code shown on the left, there are actually two calls to abs, once with an argument of minus 3, which is x, once with a call of 5, which is uh, y. So, and those two calls are shown in these color codings, okay. So, yellow is going in, blue is coming out, and then yellow is going in again. So, the only difference between these two calls is that stack.top.in is assigned two different values, x and y, but also that the to-do, which is where to return, is set differently. In the first call, it's 1005. 
the first cleanup code. In the second case, it's 1010, which is the second cleanup code. That's all. Okay. And the rest is fairly simple. So that's how the stack works. And uh, it's kind of important to know how the stack works because um, C and C++ gives you all kinds of low-level handles into things like these, uh, especially when you come to pointers. Uh, you will realize that if I pass an integer pointer into a function and I start doing pointer arithmetic on it, I may be able to write things into the stack. Okay. So here the intention is that you return to 1005 and that information 1005 and 1010 goes on the stack in the to-do field. If somehow I could write code which in the callee modifies the stack, then the callee may not return to the caller properly. Right. Remember the callee sees the top of the stack and at the end of the callee's code it says go to stack.top.to do. Suppose the callee could write stack.top.to do, then the callee could jump anywhere. This is how you write viruses. You provide some kind of a routine to someone which you think is useful, like here is my image manipulation program and somewhere hidden there is a function which manipulates the stack in the callee. So that when the callee returns, it doesn't return to a safe point in the caller from which it was called. It returns into system code inside the operating system and messes up your machine. Okay. So stack protection is a, is a big issue. Uh, in languages like C and C++, it's relatively easy to mangle the stack and then uh, you know, make the machine vulnerable to all kinds of virus attacks. So vast majority of virus attacks are through stack manipulation. So look at some of that when you do pointers. Okay, um, so coming back to separate compilation units, we saw an example where uh, we wrote a matrix printer function and uh, there are two parts in which you write it. One is the specification file or the signature file, which is the .hpp or .h file that your customers are supposed to see. They don't see the implementation, it just gives you the signature of print matrix, uh, print whatever, CS101 which gives you the input and output signature so that people can use the routine without knowing how it's implemented. And the corresponding CPP file actually implements the printing action. Okay? And it's good to separate those out uh, also because then the compiler can compile your CPP file only once and then whenever it's required, the resulting object file can be linked in. Okay? So the broad architecture is that your uh, C++ source When you give the dash C flag, it only compiles into what's called an object file. This is a compiled machine language version of the C++ source except that it doesn't necessarily have a main method so you cannot run it. It just provides some functions and variables and so on. Now you do that for a bunch of object files. So the library writer does this and in some cases if the number of object files is very large, you can again combine all this using again the G++ command or a command called LD which we will look into later on, which is a linker uh, which makes a library file. A library file is nothing but a whole bunch of .o files in one package with some kind of a lookup table saying if you need this function it's here, that's all. And this is usually named with an extension of .a for archive or .so for shared object. In case of Windows, this file would be called with an extension of DLL. Okay, so DLL in Windows is the same as .so and .a in Linux world. Okay, in fact, .so. So .as are what are called static libraries. .so are what are called dynamic libraries, which is the same as DLLs. Okay. Now, uh, so this is what the library writer has done. And on this side, here's the user or you. Okay. You write something like a main.cpp. Now remember, at the interface of all this is the .hpp or header files. They are used on both sides. They keep the caller and the callee consistent in the signatures of the functions. So the main.cpp has to include the same HPP file or files. Then it does the calling. This is compiled into main.o. 
and then main.o and either all these object files or the single library file. This, is, this goes into a last compilation or linking stage, either G++ itself or linker into a.out. Okay. So that's how this is done. And we saw how to issue command line arguments to do this. Um, just to give short names, let's say that was what? Matrix printer. So let's say MP dot O and this was main dot O. So you would finally say G plus plus main dot O and MP dot O. And if you wanted to save it to a different file, you'd say main dot exe. Instead of a dot out, you can give any name you want. Now two more small things. One is this flag called dash I. The other is this flag called dash L. And then there's also dash small L. So let me explain each of those. Okay. So uh, the default place where your G++ compiler looks for include files, that is decided by dash I. Okay. So there are two ways to include. One is to say hash include and then give angles. The other is to give quotes. If you say angle, that means look into system areas that are installed as part of the operating system of the machine. Okay. Now the default starting point for the system areas is slash user slash include. So if you go into that directory, you'll see hundreds of thousands of error files to be used in C and C++ programs. When you say quote, it, that means non-system, your stuff. So the default is to just look into the same directory as you're running G++ in or wherever the C++ file is. Okay. But if you want to add some places to look, you have to give them as arguments to dash i. So to give an example, suppose this library is already written and let me give you a directory layout under your home directory. Okay. So let's say here's your home directory slash home slash u. And then under it, there are two directories. Okay. So here is uh, some fancy, you know, say easy BMP or something. A directory called easy BMP. And you are writing a project for say, um, I don't know, uh, automatically cropping images, okay, auto crop. And you want to use easy BMP stuff in it to read and write BMP images. So let's say EasyBMP is offered to you as two files, EasyBMP.h and EasyBMP.a. Um, okay, maybe multiple C++ files have been compiled and put into one archive library file, as I was saying. Inside autocrop, you have written your, uh, say, main.cpp. Now, you have just unpacked this library by fetching it from the internet. You have not set it up in the system as a whole. Okay. So in this case, main.cpp will have to include easybmp.h. And sure, uh, one thing you could do is you could write out that include statement uh, as in the following messy form. So you could say hash include quote dot dot slash easybmp.h, that would work, but it would work only if the directories were in that configuration. If tomorrow enough people are using easybmp so that the sysad comes and installs it in user include, then if you keep this particular path in your C++ file, your compiler will no longer find it. Okay, this will work only if main.cpp's parent directory has a subdirectory, sorry, see I already made a mistake here, should be that. has a parent directory called easybmp, which has a file called easybmp.h. So that's not a very nice way to code. The better approach is to say to G++ that look into, in the make file, something like either the absolute path home u easybmp, or at least here you can say dot dot slash easybmp. So 
So if your make file is here, or if you're issuing the command in this directory, it tells the G++ compiler to look for include files also in this directory. And therefore, your include statement will now become just easybmp. Dot h. So this flag, in conjunction with a simple file name, will do the right thing. Because this flag will tell the G++ compiler to look into dot dot slash easybmp, where easybmp.h will be found. Okay. Now, generally speaking, you don't want any or at least long paths with slashes inside the include. You have to decide what's a natural root point from which things are included, and use that in the dash i, and then put the rest in there. So the concatenation of this and that should lead to the right place. Okay. Now after all this, I have to do some linking. So linking means that in the last stage where main.o has to be combined with easybmp.a to give me a.out or main.exe. Okay. To do that, you again have to tell the G++ compiler where libraries are to be found. The default place where libraries are looked for is user lib. If you want to add more places where the compiler or linker has to look for, rather linker has to look for uh, more libraries, you have to add it to the dash L flag, capital L. So here, again, you'll say easy BMP. So that will tell the comp compiler in the linking phase to look for dot a files or dot so files in dot dot slash easybm. Okay. And then the weird stuff, the small l file. This is actually a weird uh, legacy thing, it's embarrassing. So what's actually done is this dot a files always start with lib. So you'll really never compile all the EasyBMP sources to anything that's not start with a lib name. Okay? It's, a, it's a library, so it's lib, whatever else you want. And what you do here is you take out that part, and after dash L, you have to only give the rest without the dot A. Okay. So what the compiler and linker will do is that it will take this name, it will prepend lib, it will append dot a or dot so, and then look for that in any of the directories listed under capital L. Okay. So that's how it goes. And as in the last couple of minutes, I've been messing around with Compiler versus linker, so what's the difference? Um, technically, you compile using G++, you link using LD. But G++ has you know, dozens of default places where it looks for includes, dozens of default places where it looks for libraries, not just user lib, there are others, like user local lib and so on. So you don't want to keep on typing them into LD. So when G++ realizes that it has a linking job on its hands, it calls LD with all those proper parameters. So generally as an end user, you will not call LD directly. But it's the linker which works in the last phase to use these arguments. The C++ compiler uses that information. Once the source is compiled, the job of the include files is done. It's not required anymore. Once you have .o and .a and .so files, the remaining job is only for a linker. But the linker is again invoked by G++ because it's easier to find things that way, where, where things have been kept. Okay? So you don't need to worry about invoking LD directly on your own. We'll always do things through G++ only. So that's how it works. So the summary is set up your directory paths to be clean. Um, this is your project. That is stuff that other people have provided. That comes typically in two parts, the headers and the library files. It could be headers and a lot of .o files, which is inconvenient. A single output file would be nice, single .a or .so file. And then you include it. You 
the actual include statement should have a simple file name so that if tomorrow you want to relocate this directory somewhere else, all you have to change is the flag paths in one place. Okay, you don't have to change so many include statements. The include only happens once, that's not changed. The base of the include can be changed anytime in your G++ invocation or in the make file. Okay. So usually the, you won't even type this on the command line every time. You'd actually, in this directory, you'll create a file called make file. That file will include information about in, include and library paths once. And that can be reused again and again. We'll see an example of that uh, right now. Any questions? So how does uh, make do its job? Now, the basic question make asks is when we change one file or a few files in a large project, which other files need to be compiled or processed or linked again? Okay. Uh, the file system itself provides no consistency check. If you compiled a file called uh, a.out and you changed matrix printer.cpp, which was one of the sources going into a.out, the operating system doesn't interfere with your running an old executable. The executable once created is separated from the source. So a make file <coughs> gives a formal specification of these dependencies. So it's easy to visualize the dependencies through a graph like this. It's a directed acyclic graph. There is no cycle in it. So at the bottom are things that you change. And going upward are derived files, which are outputs of processing your input files. So you write Gaussian.cpp, which happens to use a function uh, whose signature is given in matrix printer.hpp. Therefore, Gaussian.o depends both on Gaussian.cpp and matrix printer.hpp. Any one of those changes, you, you are affected. Similarly, the implementation matrix printer.o depends on matrix printer.cpp and the matrix printer.hpp. Okay. Now, and then it goes upwards. So you need both the dot of files to create the Gaussian.exe file. Now, the point is whenever you change one of these files, there is an upward percolating effect. Anything that you can reach in this graph following edges from that point upward is affected. And make's job is to trace that subgraph. Make looks at this dependency structure and then it looks at what all files you have changed. It sort of pours ink into those and the ink spreads upward to the root. And for every node that's affected, it has to do it in order, in a suitable topological order so that you clean up the frontier as you go up. Now, how does, uh, okay, so a make file um, has a bunch of rules and actions. A rule has the form target colon dependency list. So in the language of this graph, a target may be matrix printer.o colon dependencies, matrix printer.hpp and matrix printer.cpp. So the the target node and then incoming neighbors are listed on the left and right side of the colon. And an action is just a program to run, same as you'd run from your bash prompt. For example, compile using G++ or link using G++. Now how does make do its job? If any file on the dependency list is newer than the target, then it has to rerun the action. Okay. Now the important issue is timestamp. Make works by comparing the last modified timestamp on the files. Even if the file hasn't changed, but its timestamp has changed, Make has no way of knowing. If you opened your C++ file and added a comment, which would in no way affect the objective object file, Make doesn't know. If the file is modified at all, Make will read on that task, just to be safe. So, and then make will schedule this web front of updates in the sense that if make finds that matrix printer.hpp has been modified, then in no particular order, make can run, rerun the compilation of Gaussian.o and matrix printer.o. And then finally, when those are ready, make will run Gaussian.exe. But the important thing is, of course, make will not do the last linking first. Make will have to proceed in an order which cleans up from the bottom. And that it will do properly. We'll see later on how to do that once we study graphs a little bit. In another example, you do something smaller. You just update matrix printer.cpp without changing the signature of the function. Okay. 
Maybe you just make the output look a little prettier or column justified or something like that. In that case, only matrix printer dot O and Gaussian dot exe will be recompiled in that order. Fine. So let's uh, try out a couple of things with our old uh, make files. We'll see a uh, one surprising thing. And last time I was a little sloppy with namespaces. I have since fixed it up. Okay, so here is my make file. Now, anywhere in the make file, you can define variables and use them. For example, you can say hello equal to hello. Now that variable hello has been defined to be the string. Uh, you can also cascade comment, commands. Uh, so what you have to do with an action doesn't need to be exactly one line. You can run multiple comments. Okay. You can, for example, print the current date, and you can echo the message. No one stops you from doing three commands to satisfy this dependency. So this is a dependency. And to refresh that dependency, you have to execute these three commands in sequence. That is the language of make. There has to be a tab here, OK? It's not a space. Make is a very old program, and it depends on specific formatting. So if you replace this tab by anything else, then Make doesn't understand what you're saying. So let's run this uh, make file. So if I say make, it claims nothing is to be done. It, it looked at the dependency structure here, found that all timestamps were exactly as expected. Let me blow this up. Uh, by the way, ls-ltr shows in long format files sorted by modified time. Okay, so as you can see, here are the timestamps. And although it's printed only correct to a minute, you can actually get more detailed timestamps by saying stat. So stat is the statistics about the file, color1.exe. It sizes about 21 kilobytes. It takes 48 blocks on disk because of some losses. And it says that the last access time of the file is this last modify time of the file and last change file. What is the difference between change and modify? I'm not up to date on this, but you guys can find out. Okay. Um, anyway, so as you can see, the, the modify time is the most important thing. So here's the modify time for caller1. And in fact, all the .o files are older than that. Caller1.o is definitely older, but so is uh, matrix printer.o. If you check the stat time, you'll find that out. So now, if I try to make, it says nothing is to be done. So let's do one thing. Let's just go and touch. Um, one of these source matrices. So, so if I list it long, you find that I updated it March 9th, 1.30 p.m. Now if I say touch matrix printer.cpp, all, all it does is up, update that last modified time. It doesn't change the file at all. I touch it and then I ls, now it's okay, 11.50. This is 1.30 a.m. as of today. And this is 11.50 as of now. So now that I have modified matrix printer.cpp, make doesn't understand that I have not done anything inside the file. It just looks at the timestamp. And therefore, now if I run make, it recompiles it. And once that is done, it will relink to the exe file. So this is where it links. Then it says, oh, you told me to print the date. I'm going to print the date. Here's the date. Then it says, echo hello. It's echo hello. Okay. So why is this? This is not the correct syntax. Okay. You have to put a curly here. Otherwise, you don't look at that variable. So again, I have to touch because, again, if I run make now, it will be quite happy with what the state of the world. So if I touch that file again, and then I make it now, it compiles again. And this time, it says echo hello, and it echoes hello. So basically, you can declare variables like these, and you can use such variables to embed your dash i and dash l flag, so that you can only define those paths at the beginning of your make file once, and then reuse those as variables inside the command lines. Okay. Just like I was doing this, you, you are free to say dash i like so. 
it's meaningless. So G++ will not check if the directory exists or not. It will just happily take hello. Okay, or let's say I said dot dot slash hello. Similar to our example here. I again touch one file to destroy the stability and then I say make. So again it compiles that file and see what it does is dash i dot dot slash hello. Okay. Now here it says ld cannot open file. Okay. So this is a problem. Because I am explicitly in the linking phase, I shouldn't be passing dash i arguments. So let's take off this example and give it in the compilation phase. So this is a compilation thing. So I'll give it a dash i parameter and I'll read on this. Yeah, so this will run. So G++ understands if it's doing compiling or linking. So this time everything goes through fine. So in the first phase, it uses the include path which doesn't even exist, but then caller1 doesn't ask for that include path anywhere, so it's fine. Okay. Then it compiles the other one, it links, prints date, and equals hello, dot dot slash hello. So that's the summary. You can create things like this. The other thing I wanted to show you is um, this matter of uh, namespaces and templates. So remember we had uh, matrix printer dot HPP. Yesterday I showed that we went into using namespace. Okay. Uh, so you could say using, but the better practice is to declare whatever you are providing in a namespace. So remember that boost is a namespace inside which numeric is a namespace, inside which u plus is a namespace. So you provide those namespaces nested like this. And then inside that, you say that I am providing a generic class which can print matrices of t's. But I'm not changing the namespace. I'm declaring the function in the namespace, but then I'm closing the namespace in the header file. And how about matrix printer dot CPP? That does the same, except it provides an actual implementation. Okay, let me hide this from you for the moment. Okay, so just look at the upper part. The only difference between the header file and this is that this doesn't have an implementation, and this actually has an implementation which just prints the matrix. Okay. Now, how am I using it? So I'm using it from caller1.cpp. And here, I use the namespace. That is the right thing to do because if you include the header and the header changes your namespace, depending on the order in which you include headers, you don't know what namespace is in effect or who takes precedence over who. It's best for h, .h for .hpp files to not change the namespace. You can declare things in a namespace, and then the co code has to use it in that namespace. Fine. Now let's look at one more thing. Um, suppose by mistake, so this will work. I can, you know, I, I've just verified that it works. Caller one will turn into. Uh, let me remove the junk from the next slide. Okay, so this will not work. Why is that? Um, so I said, you know, switch namespace to boost numeric u plus and then do that. Yesterday's worked, by the way. So see, it's complaining about something. So I say make. It's recompiling caller1.cpp. It says undefined reference to. And reading C++ error messages is a huge pain. Okay. Why? It says void boost numeric CS101 print. Okay. And inside there's this matrix of doubles is not defined, in undefined reference to. But hey, I did just defined it in, sorry, I just defined it in matrix printer dot HPP, right? What's the problem? Suppose I don't make it generic, okay? Suppose I, suppose I just declare a simple print where the input is a matrix of double. OK, 
Okay, so I comment out the old implementation. I just, or maybe just simple print. Okay. So just prints matrices of doubles, and then I have matrix printer dot cpp has to implement it, of course. Okay, so let me again comment this one out also. Now I'll implement the non-generic simple printer. Okay. And I'll do nothing but again do sort of the same thing. It doesn't matter what I do inside the function. Okay. The only thing I change is it is no longer generic, it's a matrix of doubles. Fine. So now let's try to make it. Oh, CS101 print is not declared. Right. So I have to say simple print. So now it compiled fine, but now it also says undefined references to boost, okay? So you see the problem. I mean, this is, oh, you won't see the problem. This is actually a bug in C++ and it's not our fault. Okay. The, the issue is this. That so we have a situation like this. So I have and we have caller one. Okay. This is saying I can print And this is trying to call that. The problem is this was first compiled into a .o file without knowing who is calling. Okay. Now, at least in this case, I'll explain the double case a little later. So suppose I have this. T is not instantiated with any concrete type. So if you are compiling this separately, the compiler and linker don't know with what type you'll use it. So it basically does nothing. Okay, T can take an infinite number of types, right? It could be a, you know, it could be floats, it could be bools, it could be doubles, it could be a vector of floats, it could be a vector of vector of floats, it could be a pair of a float and integer, it could be an infinite space of types. So of course the linker cannot generate code for an infinite possibility of types. So they generate code for nothing. And that's why it's not found. Okay. If you know that caller one is going to invoke it on a matrix of doubles, You have to, while compiling this, fake some code which will make it generate the code for matrix of doubles. And that's what those commented lines were doing earlier. So let me quickly change this. Um, so here is matrix printer.cpp. Okay, so I'll remove simple print from here. We'll discuss that in the next lecture, what the other case was doing. Okay. So this is just CS101 print again, which can print an arbitrary generic matrix type. Now, what I'm going to do is to add this code in matrix printer.cpp itself. This is fake code. No one uses this code actually. Okay. It's a dummy function which prints a matrix of doubles. No one will ever call dummy. You can hide it away. This just tells the compiler that I will be using this to print matrices of doubles. And now, in matrix, here this will be the same, except I have to say CS101. Okay. And in uh, matrix printer dot CPP, yeah, this was already done. In matrix printer dot HPP, what do I have to do? That doesn't need to change. I'll just uncomment this and get rid of that. Okay. So HPP remains the same. Except that in the implementation file, I have actually made a fake call to, with the correct type that my customers will use later. If the customer will also use matrix of ints, then you have to declare a second dummy function, not in the same. Okay, you can do something like matrix int dm, etc. Okay. So now let's see if this compiles. Okay, what is it doing here? 
DMO as a previous, this is easy. All right. So this time it compiled fine. Now let's try the following. So what is the size of matrix printer dot O? Remember the size carefully, 34 kilobytes. Okay. Now suppose I do something like CS101 print DM2. I've just generated a call for int matrices as well. This time if I make it, it will compile fine. I've just defined more things. Now if I list it, look at the size. So it's included code to deal with int matrices as well. So when using templates with separate headers and libraries, this is a pain that you have to take. Whatever uh, materialized types the caller will use, you have to artificially materialize them in the implementation so that for those types you'll generate the library code. Okay? But this is still much, much easier than to write this code five times over for five different types. All you do is materialize the code five different times or materialize the call. You don't have to materialize the declaration for five different types. Okay. So this is an important thing to take care of. Okay, so for the rest of today, um, I will discuss the following important issue, which is in several coding exercises, there have been two labs so far where people have felt that if only we could write nested loops with a number of nestings which is dependent on an input parameter, then I could solve the problem. It's just that, you know, in syntax, I don't know how to declare a nested for loop with a variable number of nestings. So what do I do? Right? So for example, uh, so there's earlier lab about finding the largest increasing subsequence in a sequence. There, if for every number in the sequence you created a for loop, where the next index goes from the right of the previous index to the end. Okay, then you could solve the problem easily. Yesterday, or uh, yeah, Wednesday, there was this problem about decomposing uh, what's called a semi-magic square into a sum of permutation matrix. So a permutation matrix, like a N queens board, has uh, a one in every row and every column. Okay. Now, so one thing is clear that if I gave you a semi-magic square, where every row, every column, no diagonals, added up to say C. And by some magic, I could find a permutation matrix P this is the semi magic square S. The permutation matrix adds up to exactly one in every row and column. Therefore, the result of this would be, so let's say S0 would be S1 with exactly C minus one as its rows and columns, sum. Once you take that step, you can repeat it. You can take out another permutation, take out another permutation. So the basic step you need is taking away one permutation matrix from a semi magic square. So what we're looking for is that, so you understand that. And at this point you ask, so can I do this greedily? So suppose in S0, the first row has a non-zero in this column. Can I arbitrarily place a one here? So I'll take away one from there. In this row, maybe the there is a non, first non-zero is there, so I put a one there. The greedy approach will not work. You should be able to create small three by three or four by four examples where by greedily picking the leftmost non-zero column to place a one, you will literally paint yourself into a corner. That later on you'll find that you have no choice. You want to, you have to place a one here, but there's already a, you already taken off that column from consideration. So greedy will not work. Now what do you do? So it turns out that this is a long celebrated problem but you don't need to know the, you know the difficult part of it. So it turns out you can do this in polynomial time. Um, but we are not asking for a polynomial time solution. 
So suppose I have to exhaustively search for permutation matrices so that I can take off one. It should be somewhat intuitively clear that as long as I give you a semi-magic square, there should exist a permutation which you can take out. That's not too difficult to see. The difficulty is in finding that permutation matrix. And greedily looking for it will not help. So in terms of doing an exhaustive search, which is not too exhaustive, okay, so how will you go about? Clearly, the non-zero structure of S will matter. If the first row has non-zeros in these columns, I have to keep track of where I placed a one. If that doesn't work out in the end, I have to come back and change it. Right. So suppose this matrix is n by n. If only I could declare a piece of code which says for i1 equal to 0 through n minus 1. Okay. And here I say if s of uh, I zero, sorry, I zero. If S zero, I zero is equal to zero, then continue. Right. If if the zeroth row and I zeroth column is zero, then I can't place a permutation one there. So I, I'll just continue. Okay. Now I want to write something like for I one equal to 0 through n minus 1 except i0. Okay. Again, here I want to write if s of 1 i1 is equal to 0, then continue. Right? So that explores the space of i1s. Okay. Then you say for i, i2, etc. You nest like this in the core at level n. You basically say, okay, if I found a configuration of i1, i0 through i n minus 1, then that's a permutation matrix and I can take it out. Everyone okay with this? Right. And then you close all those n loops. Right. This will come up again and again. Let me give you another example. So suppose I tell you that the input to your code is the number n, and your job is to not use recursion, which you haven't learned anywhere. Okay. You have to print all n factorial permutations of the number, say, 0 through n minus 1. And you cannot use recursion. So in particular, if I say <coughs> n equal to 3, if I input 3, then you have to print 0, 1, 2. Okay. Um, I'm not printing it in the correct order, but anyway, 0, 2, 1, and so on up to 2, 1, 0. So I have to output six lines. How to do that without using recursion? It's always good to think recursively. And then if necessary, you can implement it without recursion. Or if you don't think there will be a performance hit, you can implement it with recursion. So why is it possible to arrange n things in n factorial ways? Well, the first thing can only go in one way. Okay. The second thing can go in two ways. Once you have two things, the third thing can be inserted in three ways. That's the reason why. Okay. So suppose I give you. Um, A list of indices. Okay. So I say that I'm going to put all these in a vector. The first thing can be placed only in one way, and therefore the way index can only be zero. Okay. The second thing can go either to the left or the right. The second thing has two possible values. We'll call them zero and one. The third thing can go in three positions, so it can have values zero, one, two. So again, those are like the i0 through i n minus 1. If I give you a list, i0 through i n minus 1, where i0 can have value only 0, i1 can have value 0 or 1, i2 can have value 0, 1, 2. 
I give you this vector. It should be now easy to write out a permutation. Is that correct? Okay. So again, given this structure, I can write out a nested loop with a variable number of nestings. So I should be able to write for i0 equal to 0 only, 0 to 0. For i1 equal to 0 to 1, for i2 equal to 0 to 2, okay, etc. And here I would say print permutation i0 through i n minus 1, and I'll close those for loops. Okay. How do you write print permutation? Well, you can write it in a bunch of ways. There may be smarter ways and uh, not so smart ways. But it's basically the way of placing these things. So how do you go about it? The very zeroth element is placed somewhere. There's only one way to do that. Now you read i1, and if i1 is zero, then you place the second element to the left, otherwise to the right. In general, you have placed j minus one elements so far, so there are j gaps. The next guy can have some value, put it in the correct gap. So print perm is no big deal, you can do it. The somewhat bigger deal is how do you implement this nesting with n levels? How do you implement this nesting with n levels? Where n is an input. Okay. So instead of dealing with this somewhat difficult problems, so what I was looking for in the lab is if you go up to the point where you say, okay, um, I want to implement this arbitrary nesting where I look for positions where I can put ones, but I cannot implement it. You'll get most of the credit. You'll get 80% or more. If you have actually cracked the problem and done an exhaustive search routine, you'll get full marks. Okay. Uh, if you have taken a graduate course in algorithms, then you might know the best algorithm to do it. The best algorithm for the permutation matrix problem can be done in time, which is the number of non-zeros in the matrix, in the input matrix, times the row sum, any row sum or any column. In fact, you can do it in log of row sum. That's the best algorithm. Okay. So, but that's a involved algorithm. So now let's look at how to write nested for loops like this. Okay. So and we'll take a very simple example to keep the treatment in a classroom friendly. So suppose I have I want to write down all numbers uh, with a given radix and with a certain number of digits. Okay. We've already seen that in binary. If I define the radix to be two, and let's say I have three digits. Then what are the, how many combinations do you have? Eight. And what are the actual numbers? Zero, 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 one through one, one, one. Right. But suppose I say radix is equal to three and n digits is equal to say three. Now how many different combinations are there? Three to the power three. So 27 possible numbers. And the first number is again zero, zero, zero. Then it's zero, zero, one. Then it's 0, 0, 2. And then it's 0, 1, 0, okay, which is equal to 3 in radix 3. Okay. Then it's 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Now what? 2, 0. Okay. So this is again a situation where you would like to write a loop of the form for digit 0 okay, equal to 0 to radix minus 1 okay, for digit 1 equal to 0 to minus 1. Okay. In fact, the other way around, this would be slowest changing. So this would be n, n minus 1. So this is n. n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on. And then finally, for digit 0, the least significant digit equal to 0 through radix minus 1. Print. 
So again, I have n nested loops. If this n is part of the input, then it's a little difficult to see how to do this. But it's actually not so difficult. If you looked at that pattern, what was I doing? I was always attacking the least significant incrementable digit. If that failed, I did a carryover, overflow and carryover. Right. So let's see how to implement that. So this should be fairly simple, even if the original problems are not that simple. So here it goes. A and the printing thing. I'll print from the unit place onwards just for simplicity. So suppose I pass in a number of digits 5 and radix 3. Doesn't matter, you can give any input. I'll create a vector of integers, digits. Initially, all zeros. Now, the semantics of digits is that digit 0 is the least significant digit okay. in the opposite order. And now, in an infinite loop, I'll first print digits. So these digits are basically some surrogate for the loop indices stored in a vector. I can't really write down n nested loops, for loops. Instead, I declare a vector where I store all the indices of the for loops. Okay. And then I try to find the change point for int change equal to 0 from the lowest significant place to n digits. If the digits at change is less than radix minus 1, then I can still increment it. Okay. If it has become radix minus 1, then I can't do anything more. Okay. If I find a digit that can be increased, I increase it. I record the success. And then for all lower digits, I set them to 0. And then uh, if I change anything, I can break the outer for loop. If I couldn't change anything, then I break the outer for loop. I go out of the outer for loop. Here I break the inner for loop. Okay, I don't need to look for any more places to change. I only need to change at one place and correct the lower significant bits behind that. Okay, so how many people are comfortable with what this code is doing? So look for the least significant digit that you can increase. Zero out things that are even lower significant than that. And proceed. Okay. So it's not surprising that this will work fine. So I think I already compiled it. Yeah. So with uh, five digits and radix three, first is all zeros, then I increase to one, two, zero, one. Okay. Then it's one, one, then it's two, one, then it's zero, two, and so on. Okay. At the end, I get or twos, that's the last number. Okay. So, and how many are there? There should be three to the power five. You can do that by what's called a word count, how many lines, 243 lines, which is what you would expect. Three to the power five. Okay. So, so, what's the model of the story? So the model of the story is this guy faked what you'd write somewhat more easily as a variable number of nested for loops the loop indices went into this vector called digits. And the general strategy is, there's a bunch of indices. I want to change them in a clock, you know, like a digital clock-like order. There are faster changing digits and slower changing digits. Try to find the fastest changing or least significant digit that you can clock up. Increase that by one, and then zero out all the other guys. So now this code should give you an idea about how to hunt for a permutation matrix to subtract. So instead of digits, what will I have? I'll have columns. There will be a vector of int called columns, where the index will be the row Rx, and columns Rx will give you at what column in row Rx you want to put a 1 in the permutation matrix that you're subtracting. And so, if you think of what's going on here, focus inside the for loop, only inside here. Okay. See, there's this outside world which has somehow found the current state of digits, and I'm supposed to go to the next state. Right. 
So how am I going to do that? Okay. Can I write the permutation? What will be the, I'll not finish it up now, but let me try to just write down the code structure. You can try to finish it offline. So instead of digits, I'll just have, uh, say, const int, however many things you're trying to permute, say, equal to four. And here I'll have the insertion position. Right. That's what the permutation index works. So it's pause of n and zero. Okay. In fact, by your default, convention, when you say all zeros in case of permutation, it will be first insert zero, then insert one to the left of it, insert two to the left. So the very first permutation will print is n minus one to zero in the opposite order. And the last one you will print will be zero through n minus one. Okay. So now this is the main loop which will print out permutations. So this will be print perm on pause, which you haven't written yet. And now, uh, did change will remain. So what will happen here? Um, if digits change, okay, so n digits will be just n objects. Pause digits. Pause change can go from what to what? There's no radix now. If change is zero, then I can only be zero. So this has to be change itself. So, see, i0 can only go from 0 to 0. Okay, so, change is this index. Change runs from 0 to n minus 1. Okay. So, therefore, you say that if the position, so if change is equal to 0, then position change has to be less than change itself, okay, not minus 1. Then I can increase the position, and I change this. And the rest will be the same. I'll reset all the others to zeros. Okay. Let me just print out what this does without printing the permutation. You can do the permutation printing offline. That's easy to do. Okay. This is the same. Let's see if this works. I'll comment out the print form, which you haven't written yet. Instead, I'll just print. What else? Digits. Okay. Now, let's look at this carefully with four things. Huh? So, zero. Okay. The first guy will always be zero. Second was zero and one. Then this one clocked up to 1. This is 0 and 1. This can go up to 2. This can go up to 3. Okay. And how many entries do I have? 24 for four things. All right. So I'm just putting a one to one correspondence between a permutation and a four tuple of numbers. And I'm clocking up the numbers in a way from which I can map directly into a permutation. So anytime you have to explore a space which is controlled by a bunch of nested indices, hunting for columns in rows so that you can make a permutation matrix, looking for positions which constitute an increasing subsequence, printing permutations of things. Anytime you are faced with this, instead of trying to write nested for loops with a variable number of nestings, you make up a vector which stores the state of the indices in those nested loops. And then modify it like this. Attack the innermost loop with changes that can still be increased. And then things which are even inner than that, you reset to its starting value. Okay. So we'll discuss this in more detail either offline or in the next lecture.